Hello. Yep, that should work. Hopefully that is working, he says. Yep, that should be live. That should be live. Billy! Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? Hello. How is everyone doing today? I'm um, sorry I haven't put up a book list, but I have... Ugh. I have ten more captions to go. Ten. And it's all done. And the books, that part of the book is definitely dealt with. So, um, it's fun. It's fun. They're getting there. They're getting there. Hello, Vision. Hello, Jay Richardson. Hello, Carl. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Jay. Hello, Brockpain. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Evanhund. Uh, if Jed, Brock, if you're only here for the first 10 minutes, I will change what book I'm planning to do first. Um, hello, Sean Mack. Hello, Stephanie. Hi, Will Cox. Hi, Joe Richardson. Hi, Greg. Hi, John Shea. And Carl and Gusman. Hello. Glad it's loud and clear. Right then, um, you might have noticed I've done a little bit of swapping and changing around with things. I wasn't even sure whether the picture, the camera was going to line up and be level, but it is. Roughly. And um, Mike's sitting here. And it's up there to try and give everything a nice look. Now, as Sean is, Brock is only going to be here for 10 minutes, I'm going to show off this. Now, technically, this is produced, it's called CP38, and it's prepared by the Director of Naval Recruiting. So it's technically, it's a Royal Navy published book. I have found them on eBay, although I tend to get them free from the Royal Navy. I will tell you this now. I have had, over the years, ten of these given to me. Not a single one. The front cover hasn't broken off. I do not know who designed them, what world they are, but they are the same thin paper as every other page in the book, and the front cover, no matter how gently you treat it, always ends up breaking off. I am considering framing all 10 in one sort of picture somewhere, but this is a guide to the technical stuff in the Royal Navy. There's a reason I'm showing you this one, not the latest one. Uh, the latest one I'm fairly sure you can't find, but seeing as this one includes stuff in here, like, I don't know, the illustrious, uh, like the um, <clears throat> various ships which the Royal Navy no longer has, i.e. the castle class, it's not you know, that problematic. But it is a very interesting book in terms of they all make the case of how the things fit in together, all different parts of the Navy, and there's lots of things in here which you don't necessarily think about when you're organising your Navy or thinking about your Navy. And I wish these actually were read far more widely because they're a very cruel little, a cool little book. And it's full of information. So this is what I want to do first. Plus, they've got some very cool pictures. Although, again, it shows you exactly how old that is because the astute class is a picture in there. As is. And this is the one which I find most funny. The Type 45. And let's be honest, the pictures of the Type 45s, the mock-ups before they got in really do make it even look even more like a cone head than the real life pictures. There we go. See? Even more like a cone head. Plus, it's full of data. And um, I seem to remember... This is going to sound strange. Uh, there is... Um, I, I've seen one of these on eBay for £3 at once. So it's a really cool little book. Um, Brock Payne, sounds like that book is candidate for those sticky contact paper coverings we used to buy in my school books. I have tried that. I have got one of these which is wrapped in that, and it still fell off. Now it is, I keep all of them in a special folder, all nicely protected away, a plastic folder, all in their own, um, um, wallet, plastic wallets to keep them safe, and still... The two most recent ones, which have been in that thing the entire time, other than when I've got around reading, have even when I wasn't reading them, have managed to end up with this happening. So, really, frankly, I, I think 
what we need to do is we need to have a conversation with the Royal Navy about their internal publishing and the quality of the work they produce. Definitely the quality of the work they produce. But it's quite cool. And what I loved about it is it has all the numbers and designations for all the landing craft and the rigid raiders, which I found cool. I, I, I never really thought about them having their own numbers and names and this being this little one. And, it, you know, this is LCU Mark 9, 701, the 705 and 709 and what they're up to. It, it, I, I have to say it was only when I started going to do these books, I really started thinking like, oh, even all the little ships have, I always knew they had numbers, but I never really sort of considered those numbers as almost names. And they are almost names. And you have the crews call themselves the 709ers. It's just a cool little book to get at. And today's theme is ship weapons and weaponry, and I thought that was a good one. Because it's got, again, one of the things it had these have in it is all sorts of explanations of the weaponry systems uh, going back and, you know, what I love is there is actually a line in here. Um, yes, the harpoon missile system will be replaced in about 2000. The fact that the book was printed in 2004 didn't manage to make any of them realize this. <laughs> I presume they meant 2010, I presume. Hello, Samron. Hello, Adam Crow. Hello, Juicy Susan. Hello, Session. Hello, Tis Francis Fult. Hi, the ghost of Dread Pirate Roberts. Hello, Engaging Strategy. Hello, Plebiscide. <laughs> Plebiscide. Good evening, Dr. Alex. Thanks for the suggestion of the Royal Navy China Station book. Even if you have no interest in the station, as a look of careers of us over 100 years, it is excellent. It is. It's a lovely book. It's sitting here. And actually, at the moment, I am considering applying to something at all. Well, all Souls College is advertising for visiting fellowships. And the whole problem I've had with moving forward some of my research on Singtao and some of the incidents in the China Station is that all there isn't so much information. I've gone for all the information in National Archives and in Cambridge, but I haven't managed to spend that much time, in fact, any in the last couple of years. In Bodleian, in uh, Bodleian. So, um, even though technically visiting fellowships don't pay you anything, they do give you the accommodation and food, uh, accommodation and food. So, I am tempted to maybe apply for one, so I can just spend time Bodleian and actually get that, uh, get some of my China Station diploma stuff finished off. Sean Mac, the durable cover was cut because the bean counters could save five cents on each book. That probably does. Then Gaging Sanchi by Nasimak Mushroom. Actually, you'd be surprised. The most recent version of these I have is from 2019. Sadly enough. Oh, and by the way, the 2019 one 2019 one it was sent to me in the post. And literally it came out of the bag, which was sent directly from the publishers. With this bit, with the front cover already having come off. I mean, it was literally wrapped up and the front cover had come off. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Please? No, no, no. We'll just leave that. Hmm. Hello, Carl. Carl, Belgium. RCN took position of the first Arctic patrol ship, HMS Harry the Wolf, on Friday. Yes, they did. And they're lovely. Engage strategy. It's okay, Alex. We don't need SSM. We don't... Yeah, I know. There are so many things we're told we don't need. If anyone wants to ever sit on a very interesting meeting... Sit in some of the Defence Select Committees where they discuss future weapons programmes and some of the stuff civil servants have obviously say from the Ministry of Defence with a straight face. And you're sitting listening going, you poor, poor person who's been sent out to defend that decision. You know it's twaddle. Everyone around you knows it's twaddle. 
But you've got to defend it because that's the budget limitations and so you've got to cut your cloth accordingly. Ah. Uh, I'm per currently hoping the Norwegian new strike missile is selected as the interim enable strike missile is selected as the interim replacement for the harpoon. Because um at least then it'll probably be there'll be probably some upgrades around for a few years, because we'll probably interim will probably be about thirty years, if not forty. Pot Kane, I'd go get a bot a comb binding machine and fix it myself. Or apply the comb binding machine to the publisher's head. Both are tempting. Um <laughs> Uh, Better Squad, Dr. Clark, they know how much you like the front camera, so they do it especially for you. If they do, they're going to get <laughs> Is that the book version? Eskimo is fine. It could be all an ode to HMS Eskimo. I have, of course, not considered this. It's an ode to HMS Eskimo, these books. Um, Sure, Mac, don't worry, guys. We can throw money at problem when it comes up. Well, that is most government's policies. It'll be another government's problem to adjust their budgets to deal with that issue. So, Thompson, Dr. Clark, read the CBC's report on the Dear Wolf, and to me it was become clear the reporter had less imagination and forethought than the Navy for the ships. There is a guy called Desmond Wetton. Okay. He actually produced a book, which were, which is about his reporting of the Royal Navy. And he spent 40 years as the Times reporter of the Royal Navy. And it was actually his beat. He was, the naval, he was their naval reporter. And he describes how the Navy goes down. And he describes a situation there at one point where he is telling the minister exactly what the capabilities are of the ship which is being sent in. So he's not only asking the questions, he's having to give the minister the information so the minister can answer the question he is asking. And you just... That just doesn't exist anymore. Not in the regular press. Sandroll, NSM is very nice. Already integrated on the LCS. Gets a foot in the door for Joint Strike Missile 1. And limited land attack capability. Yes, it's lovely. And it's off the shelf. And it can be fitted to pretty much everything. So you can have commonality across the board. Bishon. Sir Humphrey states that as a civil servant, he never believes in government policy to avoid being schizophrenic. That could understand. I could agree with that. Engage Henry. NSM or RBS 15 are both strong options. ISSGW may get ported over to Type 31 when the Type 23 is finally going in the mid 2030s. <laughs> I love the way you think that the Type 23 is going to be gone in the mid 2030s. I think the Type 23 3s are going to turn into the Royal Navy's version of the F4312. I have a feeling at the FV4312, I reckon they are going to keep turning up forever. I think there's going to be a Type 23 in the Royal Navy in 2200, and people are going to go, what's it for? Just in case. I just have that feeling. The ships are getting... There's so much being talked about what can next be added onto them. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Ickers. Jeff Beeler read an article on the drive about how Harry has disappeared from UK and forces. Also, thanks to Dr. I read about the FAA's current fast movers, the Hawk. Yes. But also remember, the Harriers have not completely disappeared from the Royal Navy. If you go down and visit um, Cold Rose or Yeovilton, you will notice there's rather a large number of Harrier-shaped objects, which are apparently used by the um, <clears throat> gentlemen and ladies who are preparing for organizing deck parking on the future, on the Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Now, um, I have to say, I have heard them make some funny noises in their time, so I'm not quite sure how deactivated they were. I'm sure they're deactivated enough they officially don't count. Uh, you know. Um, Jerishan, FV430's turn 60 in three years' time. Yeah. 
And I have a feeling the F430s will be seen many years from now. After all, as we all know, in um, if we look at the Space Marines, they're using FV430s. Let's be honest, there is a, if you ever look at the Space Marines, they have still got a vehicle which looks remarkably similar to the FV430. I honestly do believe that the FV430 is going to be with us for many, many years to come. In fact, I'm still to this day surprised it didn't turn up with the clone troopers uh, in the Wars of the Republic. I think possibly that's because they were being used by the droid army. You know, that's the only explanation I have for it. Carl Gasmer, the T Type 23 will make the 295 and B52 obsolete. Probably. Ah, Harmon. Which is more likely? The government say we don't need aircraft carriers, escorts, or a navy. Also, I think government will say they don't need escorts. There's always a chance. We can hope they won't. Purpose Rhino equals F432. Jerishan, I think the Harriers are also used for fast jet maintenance training, like the uh, uh, like the Sepcat Jaguar Tornado. Uh, yeah, yet yeah, there is so many reasons to keep them around. That's cool, that's cool. They weren't used by the Republic or droids because they were in a far away galaxy long, long ago. Do not count them out. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Right then, so, um, I have an interesting book here, which I found while I was getting out the other ones. It doesn't really fit the theme, but I like it, and I thought I'd bring it up, and it's um, all about Third Division, which is a key part of the um, British Army. Uh... Forward is by Michael Howard. Original forward is by Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery. It's written by Norman Scharf, and it's a history of the four, of the third division. Uh, this particular version was published by Spellmount in 2006. Originally published in 1947, and it follows this division from D-Day through to World uh, to the end of World War II. And this division is interesting. It was pretty much at the front of everything the Allies end up doing. If you hear there are British troops advancing somewhere, 3rd Division tends to be knocking around there going, Hello! Uh, they are... How do I put this? They're one of those divisions where it, it you're not quite sure whether the Germans see 3rd Division and think... Well, they can't be as good as the first and second divisions, as they're only third, so we'll target them. Or if, because they're for cool third division, it's kind of like tribal class destroyers taking on a battleship. Yeah, we're destroyers, so you think you're better than us. We will show you we are not better. You're not better than us. We are better than you, sort of thing going on. There is a a chip on the shoulder of this division, and they keep on pushing forward. So they're a very cool. It's a very cool book, and it's a very cool division. And um, I should have really done it in the Amphibious Warfare section, because it's got some excellent maps in here. Uh, various things, you know, maps, and some pretty cool pictures. And it... <clears throat> The fact is that this was written and published, uh, written during World War II and then published so close after it, it really is as close as we can get to, uh, I don't know, a book form, day by day, accurate account of what they got up to. Jeff Beeler, sadly, USMC lost an LVT of San Diego this week. Most on board missing. That uh, was sad. I've seen that. and It's terrible. Samuel, the Dukes really are this generation's of the Anna class, to be honest. It will be bizarre to see them disappear eventually, having had them there since forever. It, yeah. Carmen, Dr. Clark, uh, can we lock up the government and we all become ministers? Honestly, some of us uh, uh, amateur historians act no more than them, than them, please. Can we please? Um, 
Unfortunately, I go with the thing of it's democracy. We go with whichever government's elected and we go with decision made by the public. Um, the thing I always point out, though, is if you honestly think you can do a better job, then run for office. Because that is the thing. The amount of times I hear people complaining about their local council, their county council in this country, or their go or the government, and the quality of their, their local MP, and this, that, the other, and I go, well, why don't you run? I have been a borough councillor. I did put my money where my mouth is. I was fed up with the way the bridle paths, which are these little sort of wooded paths, uh, wooded and grass paths, which run across our borough, were being treated. And I volunteered with one of the local parties, and I volunteered to run for council. And then when I was a councillor, that was the first thing I fixed. That and putting in some dog litter bins. It's not much. It's what local council really deals with. But in the, you know, in the scheme of things, but it made a little contribution to the environment and it fixed things. Admittedly, I didn't win or get re-elected, but it's you know, it's what you do. If you're uh, if you think that you can do better than the government, if you think you can do better than the ministers, get yourselves elected. Go for it. It's not. People often start by going, "It's very very difficult." It really isn't. It starts off very simply. It's walking around the area you live and knocking on the doors. And asking people, what are your problems? How can I help? And will you vote for me? And always in that order. Don't start off with the first one. Because if you can't deal with the first two, there is no point asking the first or the third one. And that's where quite a lot of the political parties and these days, I think, get it wrong. Because they start off by asking the first question. Or even worse, they don't even ask that question. They presume you'll vote for them. And that is when you get into trouble. That is when you get scenarios which are the big upsets, because it's when political parties presume you'll vote for them. <sighs> Jeff Beeler, how does Assault Division compare to bo uh, book Monty's Ironsides? I prefer it. I consider this a far more natural read in many ways, and I like the regiments in it more. It's a good book, this one. Um, Brock Payne, is this the third division of the UK Army which was created in 1889 by Wellesley? They, um, sort of. Uh, let's put it this way, they claimed that heritage. And there is a third division now. You know, that's one of the titles they have carrying on now. Come, honestly, I would run. I despise my MPs. He's his ex and honorary. Then go for it. And, you know, it's wonderful. And also, please, don't... The other thing I would say is, don't expect any political party to be perfect. They are always, to an extent, umbrella organizations and coalitions. The point is, you join, join the one you agree with more than the others and try and persuade it to agree with you. Engage, or you can bribe the one guy who lives in Old Sarum. Well, that is the option, yes. But, you know. Vigilant. More veterans should run for office. I hope Mr. Biden chooses Duckworth. Eh. That's going a bit too much into politics, and I'm not going to get into that one. I think myself, I think Biden's, though, big problem, I will say, for him is that almost anyone he chooses for the bottom t uh, the bottom layer of the ticket, people are going to wish is the top. And that's the trouble when you're in the United States presidential system. Um, you uh, The ticket is two names. Your big problem is when people wish the person on the bottom ticket was on the top. And I think that's going to be Biden's problem. Hey, King George V. Stephen Wilson, people vote for the people who they know who they like. There is a lot you can do about sorting out problems without getting elected. So when the elections come around, you're known as the one who does things. What I laughed was on election day, I actually got told by about two dozen people 
that I'd done a good job as a local councillor and they really liked me, but they weren't voting in that election as protest over what national government was getting up to. And I sort of went, well, that's pointless. Anyway, moving on from there. So. I have a little interesting book. Uh, I have said many times that certain people airbrush other people out of history to um, grow their own status. Well, my favourite example is Lord Chatfield. And I will give you a list of the names in the H he has in his book. Haddon, Haggard, Hall, Halsley, Hamilton, Hardmarys, Hardcastle, Harrington, Harvey, Havoc, Henegy, Henley, Henneker, Huggen, Hill, Hipper, Hodges, Holden, Hood, Hope, Hodge, Hopkins, Horan, Hornby, Hornet, Horsley, Horton, Host, Hoffham, Huskar, Hughes. Yes, he managed to go through the whole time as his period as first sea lord and everything without mentioning who his third sea lord was. And saying all the time, oh, I was responsible for this and I'm responsible for that. But still, it's actually a very good in insight into it. As long as you remember that he's basically airbrushing someone out of history to magnify his own role, um, it's worthwhile reading. And it's The Navy and Defence by Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Chatfield. So, uh, yeah. I have fun with this guy. Take care, Brock. We have some pretty young MPs in the UK. Um, second wasn't. I agree. People not vote. Are cutting off. Yeah. Resting politics back a bit towards defence. Why do you think defence in the UK appears to be getting less and less purchase on the political public list of priorities? Um, because at the moment, defence is seen as. Wars are seen as something you choose to get involved in, and defence is seen as a job creation program. When you can choose when or not you go to war, you can afford to just have one or something, because you can choose not to go to war till it's available. When war or defence, when programmes are seen more through the eyes of who and how many people they employ, rather than what capabilities they offer the nation. That is a problem, because it becomes more difficult to justify them, especially as costs, etc., things go up with inflation. So that's your problem. Basically, wars of choice and defense is a job creation program. And it's only until the wider public and political body start realizing wars are not going to be by choice. They're not even the so-called wars of choice were actually wars of choice because they're wars of national imperative chosen by whatever reason was decided to be national imperative at the time. It was decided to be an interest. And in the nicest way, the idea was that we could choose when we started them. Lovely. But we didn't really choose when we started them because would we really have wanted Kosovo when it happened? Would we have wanted the Falklands when it happened? Would we have wanted any of these when they happened? No. If you want to have, if you're going to fight the Falklands War, ideally you want it to take place in the summer. That's the south, a south, a southern summer, not the northern summer. Not when it's going into winter, because that's freaking hard on your ships. If you're going to deal with Kosovo, you prefer to deal with that when you have port terminals and things done up and probably possibly a railway line put into place so you can more easily move equipment down there. You know, that's the thing. Wars of choice, yeah, it's a funny doctrine. It's an idea which they have. Anyway, Chatfield is the poli is definitely political. Um,
The new big uh, new IKB four four seven two, and I do love the fact that you're the new uh, new Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and your number uh, your railway uh, train number is four four seven two, so Flying Scotsman. But uh, why don't we raise money for ships for have subscription subscription anymore? Um, honestly, because there isn't a political world to start it. There used to be something called the Navy League, which pushed that sort of thing, but now there isn't. It got shut down as the idea it wasn't necessary anymore. As everyone knew after World War II the reasons why we needed a navy. They forgot that people have a short-term memory when it comes to na uh, national politics. King of the Fifth. HMS Hood used to live in Portsmouth. Now she's hiding, holding on to the escort she's got. So do Shumak, frankly, it's better the people who might be older than the, the universe. Mm. <laughs> That's what the You can choose not to go to war right up until the very violent point that you cannot. Yep. decision. It's been about twenty-five years we've uh, we've had that thinking. That belief is being rapidly reevaluated. Uh, I'm not sure because the trouble is, people are prepared to invest in things which they can keep tight control of. But the trouble, is, uh, but for bigger long-term investment assets, they don't want to invest them. I, you see, I support having a cyber unit and having cyber warfare capabilities. But I don't think that money that money should come from the existing budget of what we're building and procuring in terms of physical uh, of fighting other assets because I think you need them all and you need them all in strength. I don't think cyber can replace warships in the presence mission. Cyber is a very good war fighting tool and a very good intelligence gathering tool. It's not necessarily the greatest tool for presence and for trying to deter conflict because. Well, if to deter, to deter conflict with cyber, you'd have to actually launch an attack. And if you launch an attack, A, you reveal your capabilities, and B, if you don't do anything, you reveal the weaknesses in the enemy that they can then fix, and all sorts of issues. So you can't really do deterrence with cyber. You can do deterrence with a warship turning up off the ghost going, Hello, have you seen my guns? I got some cute missiles too. Would you like to come to dinner? Come on, that's right. What do you think the budget of the UK needs to give an armed forces and replace old nearing obsolete weapons and upgrade everything? Also, RNC's Army Actors Unemployed Joint. A, armed forces are not. <sighs> armed forces are largely a middle class profession now. They are, in many ways, they are becoming, they're not a place for people without skills. They can be, because they can take people without skills and train them up. But very quickly, the armed forces have become very much a middle class sort of dominate area in terms of professional area. There are a few roles which don't require much training and much things, but those roles are rapidly dwindling and rapidly evolving into ones which do require a lot more training and skills. So... You know, I'm not sure the traditional idea of the army is a good way to employ people who would otherwise be on the doll is actually true, and any or ever it has really been true. Um, come on, why oh why do we see it as um? Just from here's a question: What was the most oversold weapon you can think of? One which turned out to be dreadfully and painfully expensive for what you got? C dart. <clears throat> There again, the the Sergeant York Spag. Yeah, I, I I could argue that one again. Engage your strategy. Could agree with that one. Could agree with that one. Engage your strategy. But um, the trouble is with Stephanie Wilson's point of nuclear is that the whole thing about them is they're deterrents, and you don't really want to use them, but you have them to stop the keep the other guys coming back to the table. And it's a classic case of you either have them or you don't have them. And if you don't have them, you accept that if someone else has them and they try and bully you, and your friends who have them refuse to use them to protect you, then you've got to give in. Whereas if you have them, then how you respond to someone trying to bully you with them is up to you.
And in Carl Harmon, answer to your question, what do you think the budget in the UK needs to give armed forces for base holding? You could probably do it on the existing budget if you were using it properly. But I'd also say that you might need to increase it up to really 2.2% or possibly really 2.5% or really 3% of GDP. Um, but I would say it's more a case of making sure you're using it properly. And also, I would say in, uh, there are certain things included in the defense budget which I would not include as being defense spending. I war graves. I know it doesn't count a lot of money. I know that people go, oh, it's included and it doesn't count, account for a lot of money. I, I would say it shouldn't be part, it doesn't account for a lot of money, but it shouldn't be part of the budget. Pensions. Also, and uh, honestly, the nuclear deterrent, uh, seeing as the armed forces might operate it, but they use it on behalf of the central government and the central government to control it, I would say that should be cabinet office budget rather than defense budget. And I would still keep spending at 2.2%, but I would just get these things out of the Ministry of Defense budget. Vision. Should Argentina have invaded, delayed their invasion of Falklands to get closer to the southern winter? It could have given them more of a chance, yes. But they didn't. They had, were forced to move by pace of events because the Britain, were, Britain was reacting to what they were doing already. So what happened in South Georgia, Britain was reacting to that. Then they decided to egg it, over egg it, because they thought if they could do it, they would force British back off. And then it didn't. Uh, Strap, Doctor, can you think of a historical period that is most similar to, today, to today's political climate? 1920s? Early 19... Very early 1930s? Um, arguably the 1890s? Arguably. There is, there, uh, you know, they're similar, but there's always differences. But that's the thing. You can. It's far easier to point out the differences than it is the similarities. But yeah. Um. Grace asking. It seems politicians now have short-term thinking as well as public. It's all focus group and poll-driven, not long-term thinking. At least at cabinet level, they're thinking about the next election. That's what governs politics when the next election is. This is the whole reason why I would love, I would love sort of, if I was setting up a democracy these days, A, I'd go for uh, a, a sort of very interesting combination hybrid system of first past the post and peer proportional representation, and um, where, and this is just my entire idea, but when I was talking about it with some friends, I thought it was quite a good idea. Um, you a I'd have the elections on an eight year cycle, so the elections would be almost a decade, slightly shorter than a decade, but it would be every eight years, and they'd be slotted in with other direct elections at different levels. But the actual main, uh, the main sort of parliament would include a assembly and a commons. The the commons would be elected by first past the post, but the assembly would be chosen in proportional representation to the votes cast for the House of Commons. And the people who could take the seats would not be chosen by the political parties, but they'd be the people who got the most votes but still lost running for the House of Commons. So, in other words, it would stop the whole problem which I have with proportional representation, which is usually that the parties pick, the, uh, pick who gets elected rather than the people. So it would do that, and then I would have a third house, which would be entire would be would be sort of modelled in the House of Lords, in that it would have fifty percent experienced people, i.e., people like former civil servants, former admirals, businessmen, or these things who are made a lord, and fifty percent lord elects who would have to be independent, and they would each have a constituency which would be two or three times the size of a Commons constituency, but they were not allowed to have been a party member and they would have to run as an independent neutral. And whereas for the other seats, uh, the other thing, uh, for the other system, it would be on the political parties to raise money. For the, for the Lords elect, it would be a system whereby if you got enough signatures, i.e. 300 signatures in your local area or something, you would then get the funding for your election campaign would come from central government, would be some money allocated by central government to put everyone on even keel so everyone could run. 
and then you'd have the sort of you'd have these uh, this free system and the political uh, the, the, it would it would make sure everyone was represented it would provide for a strong government and it would provide for a neutrality check to give some long term thinking and the idea would be you would have the elections the commons and assembly elected at one point and then four years later you'd have the election for the lords and you'd also have in those in that sort of gap period you have the county council elections and you might even have an independently elected royal prime minister who is sort of that elected to try and make it a thing given an eight-year cycle but that was my thinking about it all right Stephen Wilson, I'm teasing Dr. Clark. I know you are, don't worry. But I also, I like, I still make the point because it has to be made sometimes. Jerishan, um, granted, but we should upgrade till then. So also the army still has main, is main armor and not upgraded to is it challenging Moria. Yeah. Jerishan, how was Afghanistan a war of choice? Okay, that, that's the thing. It, Al I would say Afghanistan wasn't really a war of choice it was a response to a situation but the thing is it's still considered in an era when wars are by choice and i suppose you could argue that you could have chosen to just bomb them to kingdom come and not actually send in troops but you can't really deal with al-qaeda without sending in troops even though it is actually quite a bad scenario you ended up in afghanistan anyway all right William Cox, Toad Sonar Rays are so last century. Aren't there new sensor systems development meant to allow ASW escorts to maintain position in the battle group while scanning? Uh, yes and no. There are some self propelled sonar boys, which I think are being looked at, and various things like that. But Toad Sonars are still, Sonar Rays are still fairly good. And I think you're going to get Dash and Drift still being an ASW Pickett's main method, modus operandi for a long time. Gargas with Cyber Warfare. Well, if every MP smartphone laptop, laptop still, we'll start with. I am. You can get a nice budget on Cyber Warfare. Yeah. Jeff Bielan read an article about Austria's Eurofighters. Can afford to fly one plane with muscle and one missile about eight hours a day because of cost. That sounds about right. Uh. Jerishan, the issue is the army wants middle class people, won't pay the money to attract middle class people. Even the pension is, yeah, that I do agree. Subtitled so Leonidas to the Amphibians and Athenians. I have brought more soldiers than you, ha uh, you, my friend. A standing army forces have always been a must. They're useful. I right, new IKB four four seven two. I like GWR and LER too. My N gauge railway is GWR. My OO gauge is mostly LNER, with a little bit of LMS because my dad loved LMS. But mainly, I have to say, God's wonderful railway has always been a special friend of mine. Uh, a special su uh, subject for me. That's something I enjoyed. Yeah, I agree. MPs are not there to do what you think they should do, but you pick them on the basis or you think they can make good decisions on your behalf. You hope so. Stephen Wilson, I love the idea of nuclear deterrence being in the cabinet office budget. Hilarious for it would be interesting. I, I I could just imagine how that would cause all sorts of fun, especially when they start sending cabinet office out to audit submarines. Ooh, sure, Mac. What was the place where that joke that eventually the Navy and Air Force will share one aircraft and the Marine Corps will get on leap days? Yes, uh, that was America. Engage, Sharon. William, modern Toad Ray Rangers are substantially different from the, even the systems they replace. There's no magic wand. No. At the moment, there is a new OV around the corner yet. Hmm. Carl Gannon, can you imagine eight years of Trump? At the moment, I'm... Uh, there's part of me which is suspicious that's what's going to happen. If I was going to place a bet on the US elections, that possibly be which way I'd be betting at the moment. 
and I know what the polls say and all the other things, but I it's just something about Biden. I just don't have that feeling. I think he's not. I, I'm not sure if he's going to do it. Decision. I think the UK has shown that unelected second chambers are pretty awful. They can actually be. They can be very good. Um, they can also be very bad, which is why I, in my House of Lords, you have sort of half elected, half unelected. And the elected ones are neutrals and independents, and the unelected ones are independents. And you also would have a limit of service. I would say you'd keep the title, but you'd be limited to serve as an unelected lord for, I don't know, let's say because we're putting him in there for experience anyway for 16 years so they can serve two the equivalent of two terms and then they get a small pension added to onto their already probably government pension afterwards I mean. Grace uh quite like your plan but what about making laws an expert chain with members uh, members elected by the profession rather than the public because in my experience if a profession is electing someone to its leadership Normally, they work on two policies. One of them is the Peter Principle, i.e. we want to get this person as far away from causing us trouble as possible. Let's put him into a management role. The other one is they're very good, but they're also uh, very good. But the 50% rule is what worries me, which is why I would probably have those people be appointed by a committee of the Lords Elect. So the Lords Elect would, commit, uh, would uh, uh, basically pick the Lords, uh, a Lords Expert. Agreed, Mitchell Oates. Sam Wilson, I fly in the Green Party. Our list of potential MVPs were elected and ordered by the party members for that area. I know. I, I, I still am not necessarily the most keen on that one idea, which is why my one there selected in my system, it was selected by public vote. Rent. Callaghan, even the French uh, French have reduced the term of the president from seven to five years. Yeah, and that sort of makes it shorter, and I'm not sure about that. This runs, the way I would do it. Mm. Mm. The FBN, topic change. Who was responsible for 1920s classic class and county class uh, uh, cruises archaic look? And why no unit system? Well, A, the British thought the unit system wasn't that particularly um, as survivable as it turned out to be. And honestly, it's one of those things I don't understand. Because if you look at the way the E-class, especially um, Enterprise looks, and then you look at the county class, it just looks like so retroactive. And I think the problem is that what happens is one of the battleship, uh, the battleship guy gets in charge of the cruisers, and he doesn't understand what the new cruiser designs are, and he doesn't understand why decisions are made. So he goes with what is that look, and then you look at what comes later in the light cruisers, and they're all taking after Enterprise and developing from that, and sort of go, okay, yeah. To be honest, our ranks of Vada was overrated. Yes, they are. Hmm. Khan, personally, I think the RAF should be purchasing a uh, few A29 Super Tanagano, and then they should also make a naval version, make for good planes for training and for use when the combat is sent to Afghanistan. Uh, you, I would agree with that myself, and I actually have written papers about that, but I would also add my fear with that was that it would eventually at some point find itself in use against a peer enemy, and they would then have a lot of trouble. So this is why in the end I came up with the idea of, can we get a UAV based off that sort of idea? Okay, do treaty organizations such as NATO or the Old Wars Mac never affect national defense of a nation? Not really. 
They can, it depends how politicians approach them. If they approach them as a way to work in to spread the cost of development and the research development cost of equipment, they can actually allow you to get more for your, more for your budget. But if you approach the, if politicians approach them as a way to make up for failings and gaps in their own force structure, then you get problems. So former can be positive, second, uh, latter can be negative. Hi, Martin. This is form. I would have professional orgs choose their own... Hmm. Yeah. Jeff Hitler, what was the excuse of sending Sea Harriers into retirement? The idea was that we would only be doing bombers, bombing runs. And it was... One of the interesting things is the fleet air was after put forward how they would upgrade the Sea Harriers to the Sea Harrier Mark III. So they put for in all the requests that they made, and then that same list turned up as a list of faults with the Sea Harrier. And because this was, there, it would cost so much money to rectify them, they were going to get rid of them. And from that moment on, the Fleet Air Arm really didn't trust the Minister of Defence, which I can understand why. Sanron, best political system, uh, absolutist naval monarchy. That would make me and Drac princes. We could work with that one. Um, Sanron, serious question though. What happened to British missiles after Sea Slug? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, so many things. <laughs> so, so many things. Oh, God. Right. Actually, that's a good opening for this one. Today, one of today's book, Norman Freeman's Naval Anti-Aircraft Guns and Gunneries. And I do love this book. Mainly because it has a picture like of the skewer like this. And that is what the skewer was for. It also has some good pictures of War Spike. Um... There is also an eight-barreled pom-pom in here. Which is cool. I would say, looking through this, and it's one of those things, when I'm reading about the twin four inches and all these other weapon systems in here, and I'm looking at them, my main thoughts go to, and some of the great drawings by John Lambert, which are in here. Um, my thoughts mainly start going to, why? did we have all this stuff being developed and not deployed? And of course, the real reason is that you can never, you were developing all this stuff and the whole idea was it was being developed with the idea that wars were going to be in the the war was going to be in the 1940s. So they had time. So the reason the British and everyone's developing their stuff and is caught with, to an with their trousers down is literally because they are still trying to develop things to the point at which they're going to be viable and so they haven't reached the point in the process where they go from research and development and experimentation to implement to implementation and construction. But this is a very cool book. This is one of those ones of Normans which I really do enjoy. Uh, I have to say I do agree with my friend Jamie, um, that's Armoured Carriers, in that it is a little bit repetitive, but... The reason for it being repetitive is it looks at each nation in turn, and each nation is sort of grappling with a similar problem. And this means that they end up sometimes approaching rather similar solutions, which is why it feels repetitive. It's not actually being repetitive. It just feels that way because of the fact that they're approaching a similar problem. So they're, having, they're coming up to some similar solutions. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is beautiful. Seriously, the sextuple bofos were just cool. They're little couplers and everything on. Frankly, if you want to cause someone a lot, a lot of trouble, 
a sextuple gofers would have been really, really good. And actually, uh, that was an interesting conversation we were having. And you're going to hear next week in the bilge pumps. In that, one of the interesting ideas which came up was actually if HMS Vanguard had still been in service, hadn't even if she even if she hadn't been in service in the Falklands War, if some of the sextuple um, Bofors had been kept available and had been able to be retrofitted the ships, it would have made it a lot, lot more secure in San Carlos against air attack. Because really, the sextuple Bofors was one of that would have been the best weapon system to have in there. Mm hmm. Right, slowly I'm losing live chat. Right now. Um, Stafford Thompson, have to do this here. I'd rather have Trump than... <laughs> oh, that's quite scary, but possibly true. Mm. And new guy KB four four seven two LMS post tiny is a lot of GWR with outside valve gear. Hmm, tempting. Oh, Harmon. That's true. True current governments that would probably try to argue they don't need jet fighters because they have that, or they don't need... Yeah, there's all sorts of things they do. I was thinking, well, except for PL government, maybe. Mm. At some point, there's a naval book chat. This is a naval book chat. It's just naval books tend to go and do more things. Um, that's certainly... And once we start going off the naval and the fence, I think we are going far too much into the politics. I'm just saying that, noticing some medical provider stuff appearing. Deb Squad. Um, uh, the sea slug was very good at making Argentine conscripts surrender, not because of any casualties, but the horrendous noise it made going over the heads. That just wouldn't surprise me. I have heard some of the things, but I'm, I'm not quite sure about this veracity. Um, Himlinger. Ha Hello, Himlinger. I don't know if I've seen you before. How many ships do you need for a class to be viable with regards to operational readiness? Um, it depends what you want to do with it. If you're talking about aircraft carriers, you probably need about three. Two is the idea that, you know, you can choose when you're going to war. Three is guaranteed, guaranteed available. Four is guarantee of one at sea. If you're talking about frigates or above or escorts, thing, you're probably, you know, you work up in that. So if you want to guarantee you have two at sea at any one time, you're probably going for eight. If you want a guarantee you have two available at any one time, you're probably going for six. And you work up like that. If you're the Americans, you usually have five, so you have a surge capability. So you can guarantee you have one at sea. You can guarantee you probably have one available, uh, one to two available, and one to two at sea, and then you have the others in refit and the various stages of things that sort of going. So that is what you're sort of talking about. Uh, when you're talking about numbers, you're sort of you're working in multiples of three, two, is a theoretical thing. Three is more practical. Four is guaranteed one at sea. Five is you've got a surge capability. Six you've guaranteed probably have one at sea and one available. Um, possibly even one at sea and two available. Eight you've got two at sea. Probably two available, da, 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 and you can work your way down like that. Sure, Mac. I don't think the F twenty two is in production anymore. Actually, which right, please. <sighs> Engaging strategy. Glamorgan enjoyed employed sea slug in gash mode as AOWC in San Carlos Water. Essentially, they jury-rigged it to fire on a line of bearing taken from a Pelorus feed. Um, 
Queued for bearing by army spiders to short. That just sounds scary as anything. I would not want to be those army spotters. I would not want to be anywhere near it. Jeffy, how did the Dutch get it right with the Bofors? Um, luck in some extent, but also because because they had a smaller number of ships. Um, to an extent, they were more obsessed with hitting power of their individual weaponry. Whereas other navies were going, oh, we can have a huge number of 20 millimeters, or we can have a huge number of pom poms. Uh, and that was the case. But there was there are good things with pom pom, good things with Vofa. Himlinger, considering the high cost of a Catabar CVN, would it be better to have, for NATO to have shared CVGBG consisting of a member nations pitching in and having goods CVNs akin to the Ford class? Um, I would love to see how that would operate. The trouble is an aircraft carrier is such a national piece of an, uh, the puzzle, is such a national asset that, um, honestly, yeah, it, unless it, the only way you could get that is if the European Union starts buying their own equipment or NATO buys it, and then you might get it. But it would have to be bought by NATO or bought by the EU. It could not be bought by... Um, a country for it. It just wouldn't work. It'd be a national asset. Vision. Our surprising long-term government policy in the US is that it made it, that made it through free. Is that is the privatization of transport to the space with NASA. Um, that's basically them spreading the cost of space, oh, space research. That's a classic uh, in the nicest way Anglophone technique. Of, um, oh, this is becoming very expensive. Let's spread it out to commercial companies. Let them take the cost. It's what formed the East India Company. It's what formed the Hudson Bay Company. It's what formed all these things. If a government wants to do it but doesn't want, is fed up with bearing the cost and the problems, uh, they tend to try and let the private companies, the private sector does it. And eventually, they, it usually works out the government has to step in because the private companies go a bit too far. Because they don't get self, they're not that good at self-regulating. But by that time, we'll probably have a functioning colony of Mars trying to do all the mining, and it'll probably be a um, lovely uh, <laughs> East India Company scenario <laughs> where the governments have to step in and go, "Nope, you've gone too far." Um, Martin Doc, FA seem, always seems to get the expletive end of the stick shafted after all one and after period 37 to late 60, they lose the CV. Yeah. Yeah, there is always a problem for them. Uh, the, the fleet air arm, it, because it's. How do I put it? The trouble is for the Navy, if you do a layered air defense, people start to think it's like Jenga. You can take one of the bits out and you've still got the other layers. That's the trouble. Vision. Hilarious how old obsolete weapons like the Bofors would have been effective in modern war once they, the war occur, occurs and we see what we are fighting. Yes, pretty much. And actually, honestly, um, I have the, the there is this feeling I have if we ever end up in a mod uh, in a sort of uh, a longer running war against a peer or near peer I have a feeling a lot of those ideas about single barreled weapon systems are going to get rapidly turned on their head because whilst I understand the maintenance and the issues of it I think if you have a certain number of positions you can actually mount weapons in having a multi barreled or at least a double a two double barreled system Makes sense. For example, if I was building the Type 31s now, they'd have a double 57 millimeter, a double two double 40 millimeters on them, because that would be how I would be working it, because that would provide me with a significant increase of firepower vis-a-vis -vis the situation, the positions, especially firepower in the critical moments, because that's the point. The extra barrels, what they do is they double the amount of shells you can get down at a range at any time. And if your intercepts become have to become by necessity quicker, that's a far easier way of increasing the chance and likelihood of intercept. It does increase the maintenance issue, but you know it's, it's there. Um, <sighs> engaging strategy bites tongue on CVS. I know, I know, but. <sighs> 
You see, the idea which was going round was that the uh, you'd have Al you'd have Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, and then Ocean would be placed by an LHD, and then that same class would slowly replace Albion and Bulwark, and that class would be built slowly. And so you, and Ocean would have stayed in service a bit longer, and then you'd boom, boom. You'd probably have Ocean and probably Illustrious staying longer as LPHs, and then you'd have LHDs come on with ski ramps, and it would have made sense, and everything would have worked, and it was a beautiful system, and uh, yeah. Leave it to one side. Um, Trent Langer, there's a little details in Freeman's AA's work spread throughout the book, such as the thumbnail sketch of the Royal Navy's AAR rearmament program for the British Pacific Fleet. That was fun. Uh, Trent Langer, when the BPF showed up, they found that USN used large amounts of remote controlled drones to train gunnery crews. Trent Langer, the drones were operated not only by from shore bases from US warships, crews of Pepe. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Trent, but I, I think you've. Okay, so um, there is something called the Queen Bee Drone. And the British have been using it since the mid-1930s for their air defence training. Okay, have a look. Um, yeah, the British could use towed targets for a uh, thing, but there are various drones which were in service. Which were being used and had been in use for quite a while. Uh, this is one of my things with Norman. He does like to say American first, American best, American carry aviation needs to be funded. And I do love it, but um, there are points that we have fun in there. We'll leave that to one side. <laughs> What do you think of the political uh, practical of NATO having a uniformed uh, module of ships and uh, equipment amongst members, excluding politics as such idea? Uh, it could work if you went and allow the Danish to set it up. If you allow anyone else to set it up, it won't. Because the Danish have managed to make Stanflex work by being practical and simple with it. Jerison, um, Dutch Clark, why was HMS Ocean the only ship in her class? What possessed the Navy to buy only one? The Navy wanted two. But they only got one. Because the idea was you already had the three Invincibles. So with HMS Ocean, you suddenly had four ships. And from there, you could usually have one ship available to operate as a carrier and one ship available to operate as an LPH, which is what happened in Sierra Leone in 2001. Um. Uh, Jane, Dr. Clark, talking of books, my father gave me an early birthday present this weekend, namely both of Norman Freeman's Cruiser volumes. I know you've reviewed at least one of them recently. Yeah, they are cool books. They are cool books. I love the Cruisers. Um, I have behind me the British Cruisers, and I have the American Cruisers somewhere around here. And they're, they're good books. You'll enjoy them. You're, you're lucky, Jay. Paul, Dr. Sean Mack, thanks for doing the admin today, by the way. Um, Paul, Dr. Clark, did the FAA assume that carrier-based aircraft could never match the performance of land-based ones? No. In fact, the first thing the Royal Navy did once they got control of the fleet air arm was ordered 2,000 horsepower engines. If war hadn't come till 1942 uh, for the Royal Navy, they would have probably had aircraft equivalent to what the Americans and the Japanese were fielding in 1942 because they'd have had the engines they needed and they'd have had the aircraft built. Um, the trouble was that the war came in 1939 before the engines were ready. And by the time the engines were ready, the Battle of Britain was still going on and the Air Force had first call on the engines. So that's what happens to the Royal Navy. Mishrotes, for a viable class of ships, you also have the economy of scale when it comes to cost of spares and maintenance. Yep. Going on. Dr. Clark, how did the Royal Navy manage to build so many capital ships in World War One? Uh, a lot of very large shipyards. Basically similar to what the Chinese are doing now, where you have lots and lots of big yards. 
and you keep paying for those yards to get bigger. And you do that in the Britain's case, we did that by encouraging um, a cruise liner race and building lots of warships. Both things, so there was consistent income coming in for those yards, so they developed as big, as practical as they could without the government actually having to invest direct money. Gemma, East Miles Company, transforming into Miles Raj. Yep. Jebula, other than... In fact, actually, I'm surprised Britain hasn't set up the, uh, the distant Mars company or something. The British, uh, the British Space Expo, uh, what would be called? Uh, would it be called the British Space Company or the uh, British Galactic Corporation or something like that? The government have forty percent stock. Yes, carry on. Uh, start set up to do e exploit asteroids and planets in space. Jeffrey, yeah, other than submerged tubes, did any Royal Navy ships carry a reloads uh, for torpedoes? Uh, officially, there aren't many which do. Mostly, those are cruisers. Um, unofficially, uh, well, let's put it this way: um, the tribal class technically have four torpedoes, and I have found incidents where they have managed to fire six or seven in a battle. So that would suggest to me that they are carrying reloads, even though they're not technically really supposed to. Um, Sav Thompson, does well. Now you're getting into the expanse. You've seen it. Heard or, or highly recommend the series. Um, honestly, I haven't managed to see it, and that is because I've been finishing off the book, and I didn't want to get distracted. But I might well get in uh, get into it soon because both Jamie and Drax seem to be mildly obsessed with it. So I need to probably look at it, um, so I can understand what references they're making in Belge Pumps. I'm so looking forward to all your reactions to this week's Build for Trumps when it comes out. Oh, it's going to be so fun. Seriously, Michael Clapp is just... He was on form, and it, it, it's going to be fun. With some of the things which are going to come out from it, and I can just imagine some of the stuff which is going to come out. It, we are going to probably have to come have him come back again in future with questions from you all. Vision. SpaceX and other companies and transport space transport companies are like Cunard and PO. They survive on government contracts and subsidies. For steamship, it was mail and merchant cruiser contracts. Yep. Him like Was it good or bad for the RN to switch to Stovel, considering a Catabile CV has a better bring back and the F 35C has better range than the F 35B? Right. So I've gone into this before, but I'll explain it again. If you're a small nation, there are only so many hulls you can afford. If you do, so you either go Catabar or you go you go Stovel. Now, in Britain's case, if you're planning on having LHDs to replace Albion and Bulwark with ski ramps on, then they can operate the F thirty five B, and so can your Queen Elizabeth carriers if they're also be if they're both with ski jumps efficient and far more efficiently. And you can't really make them Catabar. Now, I know the Chinese are planning one which is going to be Catabar. I'm not quite sure how that's going to operate because getting an LHD up to speed that it can launch, that sort of thing is going to be interesting. But the idea was then you would have three or four, you would have four or five ships which could all operate different variations of the same air group. So if you have an exact accident to one, the others are able to pick it up. Now, currently, Britain has decided at the moment not to build those LHDs. They're not, well, they haven't officially decided. They just haven't announced them when they were supposed to, so we presume they're not coming. Uh, you know, Ocean got sold off a replacement, and she it was supposed to be her replacement, then Albion, then Bulwark's replacement sort of thing. But the thing is they could still be built, and they would make sense, and that would then be the option. You would have the four or five ships which you could also operate F-35 Bs off. So it would be, let's put it this way, the F-35C is the better plane in terms of your strike range, etc. But the better strategic and co a choice for a nation might well be B, if you can have more platforms which can operate it, so you can build in more redundancy into your uh, forces. So it's about that. It's, it, it's strategic, basically. Also, having a multi-barrel place and placement, odds are that you have at least one, uh, some of them loaded at critical moments. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Clark, given the same budget for the wolf, 3.5 billion, how would you change a rework design if it were placed on your desk to work? Did we get the best we could? Um, I 
Honestly, for that, you've got a very good design shit for what you're looking for. I would personally have preferred it slightly better armed, but I'm not sure what I would cut to make it better armed. So, Tom, uh, okay. Paul, Dust Glock. 40mm shells far easier to produce in the CSAT, assuming MBDA kept the keep production line open after initial orders, and supply chain less complicated. Again. Um... New IKB-472, I've often worked, uh, wondered, take the AA battery of a King George V and plug in a modern radar and fire control with automated uh, traverse. Elevation, firing, and loading, if when possible. That would be a very interesting system to have on anything. Engage strategy. To what extent do you think defensive missiles are wa want warning in their viability? Dwindling numbers of ever more exquisite weapons, many of which can't cope with emerging threats. Mm, DW... Direct energy weapons is the answer. I agree to an extent direct energy weapons are an answer. But... You see, the point is this. Direct energy weapons are still being developed, and I do proceed, proceed in the answer, but they also do require quite a large amount of energy generation. Which means you're not going to get them fitted to quite a lot of the current generation of ships. Even though we talk about the fact they're being built with space, etc. for these things, it's quite difficult to up the energy amounts enough, and you've got to put in cabling and the sort of things. So this is why I'm going for the multi barreled approach, because I think if you can have both, that's the best option. And honestly, also, I would prefer both as the, mo um, as the best option, because, again, with the direct energy weapon, I cannot fire a warning shot. Because if I do, I just make some water boil, and they may or may not notice that. Trub, Doctor, what is the largest iron vessel built in the US at Yards? I think it's probably a frigate. I think they're probably built in Canadian Yards, no frigates and corvettes. So probably a supply ship. To be honest, a lot of Americans think they invented the ironclad. Uh, there are lots of people who think they invented things. Mitchell Dart, or double-barreled AA mounts. Alternative, on the, uh, alternative. Uh, another alternative would be the Gatling-type mounts, uh, such as here, if rounds per minute is a concern. Mm, yeah. Trent Lang, Queen Bean drone had no dive bomb capacity. USN drones did. This was due to RFRN horizontal bombing and torpedoing planes that were the only threat. Uh, actually, I've seen pictures of the Queen Bee drones doing dive bombing, so um, I'm not sure about that one. And honestly, any aircraft can simulate dive bombing capacity. You just have to make it go down. Unfortunately, it can hit you. Um, I, I would say, yeah, Queen Bee drones are pretty good. And it was the RAF policy that horizontal bombing was going to be at the RN. We're very, very concerned, especially after experience in watching the Japanese in China and the Spanish Civil War that dive bombing was a reality. Hence, they developed the skewer. Chepila, what weaponry does Queen Elizabeth class carry? Uh, mainly phalanx and some 30 millimeters. Transform. The Great Depression was hugely demanding the budgets. How do you think the global navies would have developed if it never happened? Ooh. The Great Depression never happens. You both have more money to play with and also less likelihood of some naval spending because some of the naval spending was done to keep people employed in the Great Depression. So that's the thing. The Great Depression is a two-edged sword. You might lose money, but you also have more money spent on you because they have to build stuff to keep people employed. It works. <laughs> the plus side, that's like, can we have some details of your book titled Publisher Expected Release Date? Well, the expected release date was December, and I, I'm still sort of functioning on it, but um, yeah, they're talking about it. It's Pen and Sword. And the, the title of the book is um, Tribals, Battles, and Darings, the genesis of the modern uh, general purpose destroyer. And it's all sitting not far away from me on, in paper form, and frankly, at the moment. And it's it's gone with them, but it's uh, there's some fun going on. I'll deal with it.
We're having fun with captions at the moment. <laughs> Hamlinger, thanks. Now, the Switch sense at the moment. Still think it was uh, wrong with the UK, but hey, such is life. Yeah, you see, that's the thing. The, uh, the, I can always, I can sell both as an option. Catabar versus F35B, uh, you know, a stubble. Um, I can, you can sell both as an option. I always think that if you are Britain and you're planning a mixed buy of LHDs and carriers and you're not going to have enough to be able to guarantee the availability of EVA, uh, so it's going to have to be joint, then stubble is the best option. If you're buying enough, you can guarantee the availability of both, i.e. if you're the Americans, then Catabar is the best option for your carriers and Stobble is the best option for your LHDs. The transfer, I think, can... no, the British would never have bought the Raphael. <laughs> no matter, if you, even if you offered them to us for free, we wouldn't have bought the Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, there are just too many jokes the British can make with Raphael's. Um, we'd more likely to have bought the Gripen, but probably bought, probably we'd have ended up buying a mixed buy of E18 Super Growler, E18G Super Growlers, and F35Cs. That would have been it, <clears throat> probably. <sighs> um. Jeff Bielan, no effect of catapults. That is also a problem. Emails is not really at the level it's capable yet. So that would have delayed their entry in the service. Trentalenko, regards missiles. 3D um, printed drones and missiles on loan are increasing at an exponential rate. Ah, yeah, they're always talking about them they're increasing on an exponential rate. Let's see what they can do when they actually impact things. Um, I think they, I, I think those things are going to be quite interesting. Um, that was good. Well, I would say, but something is happening with a spaceship and coming back to the planet. Mm. <sighs> My number production. Dust o'clock. Hi, Night Heron. How how you been? Hi there. Haven't watched, listened to Bill Shorten. Are there still? Are they all audio podcasts or video? All podcasts. And will Michael Clapp episode be purely on SimSec, or will segments make it onto YouTube? They are all done for SimSec, and they're all put up there as podcasts. But there's always some sort of things that could be done. But uh, we do them as podcasts because the question would always be whether it would go on mine, Drax, or Jamie's YouTube for starters. But also, it's the fact we enjoy doing them as a bit of a podcast because... <sighs> We get to make funny faces at each other and wind each other up in ways we probably couldn't do if it was coming out on video. It would look very, very immature, but we love it. And Michael Clapp was joining in at one point because he kept shifting his um, glasses around going, mm-hmm, <laughs> and all sorts of things. Jabila, the ESN built L LSDs and escort carriers for our on the on the lead lease. Yep. But then of course the escort carriers come to Britain and Britain rips out all the American fire suppression stuff and most of the electronics and puts in their own before they declare them operational. Because they don't trust the American supplied equipment. Um uh, after what happens to one of the first ones. Come on, guys, Dust Clark, uh, read 40 millimeter both of us. Until they come out with a guided shell like 57 and 76 millimeter, I would limit 40 millimeter in closing weapons system role. Yeah, I can sort of agree with that, but um, the 40, I, I have seen some testing on the 40 millimeter guided shells going around, and I think that's going to be out soon. Pretty cut down cool. Paul Kentman, hello, Paul Ketchman. Um, not sure if I said hello to you before. With regards to the directed energy weapons not being able to fire warning shots, the Navy already has a few so, sound and marred laser weapons for firing directly at people as non-lethal deterrents. Yes. The trouble is, when you're doing this in warship on warship scenario, uh, it, 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 non-lethal doesn't work like everyone else talks about it. When you're doing it on a potential terrorist boat or potential um, uh, fishing violation vessel, that is one thing.
Jeff, are emails fully operational? Well, the Ford USS Ford claims they are. Kung, I think the largest ship built in the US for the Iron was, was support ships, i.e. cargo ships. That's thinking. If you're thinking large in terms of size and tonnage, it's probably the cargo ships, actually. Because some of them were bigger than CVEs and LSDs. Interesting. Emails are on Ford. The issue was that the Prince of... Uh, the people who has fitted them, uh, she, Prince Wales fitted, she'd have received the first outfit anywhere in, with all the associated ironing out problems. Yep. Paul, Dr. Clark, I watched an old Time Watch uh, doc on HMS Glorious. It includes interviews with surviving pilots who said problems with when the captain wanted to gauge shore targets using aircraft. Yeah, there's always problems with sort of things uh, with, pilot, uh, with certain <clears throat> captains. Glorious did have a uh, fun command structure issues going on at the moment. At the time. Um, frankly, I agree the captain gets sometimes an overly bad rep, but I also agree that the captain was not necessarily operating in the best fashion. He should have had aircraft. He should have made made sure that aircraft were being airborne to give him overwatch and spot for something like I don't know the Shan horse and Eisenhower coming over the way. Because at least then, a he might have been if he had an airborne watching aircraft. A he'd have probably spotted them. Uh, they'd have been spotted. B. They would maybe have been able to turn away, launch a strike, and also scream for help. Because let's be honest, there were battleships in the area. There were other ships in the area which could have come helped. Yes, there was a cruiser which couldn't because it, it had the King and Queen of Norway aboard. It could not come help. Its job was to get them home. That's its job. You know, and this is why that was the priority because that keeps because uh, it would have get sunk by those two, the Sharnoth and Eisenhower. So it couldn't do anything to help in the situation. It would have just lost its primary mission. But as far as rest goes, yeah, there could have been something. Mm. This front of Jeff, I'm sure Q was originally designed to use. No, they weren't. They're always going to be gas powered. There is, if you're trying to make a steam catapult work from a gas system, you need to burn a lot of gas. And you need to also put in steam piping, whereas they have the space for the electric cables, uh, cabling for emails designed in. They don't have the space for the steam piping. Trent and Co. Microwave energy beaming or close range magnetic recharge to small drones for warships is a very significant cable in the future. Near future. Um, that's another. Uh, Trent, I see these ideas put forward a lot. And I, I get that they're, oh, everyone's always telling me they're in the near future. 3D uh, energy beaming and. Uh, magnetic charge, the first person to talk about them, first paper in the Royal Navy sense, it is written in 1960, the late 1960s, 1969, I think. And it's the beginning of the microwaves, and it's talking about uh, sort of in terms of their becoming more commercially practical and these things. And they predict, uh, they are confident that they will develop and it will be in service in five years' time. So that would be 1974. It's 46 years later. Where are my rechargeable swarm drones? Yes, I agree that they will probably come about at some point. But it's like a lot of these systems... I'm not. I'm not going to hold my breath because I will probably die before they do. Ambition. The biggest ship built in USA for RN was very likely escort carriers. HMS Archer, Long Island class escort carrier, 15,700 full tons full load. There were a few ships bigger than that, I think. There were some, some which were in 20,000 ton range. Hmm. From memory. Hey, man, so the podcast is sort of top gear of naval matters. Yes, it is. It's me, it's Drac, it's Jamie from Armour Carriers. Two Brits and an Australian. Mr. Lux, ah, that's right. SpaceX crew capsule is scheduled to splash down right about now. Oh, cool. Hi, Daniel Freeman. Sorry, mate. I can produce a, d a note from my doctor girlfriend for being late. Um, go on. 
<laughs> Sorry, I haven't replied to your message on Patreon. I will get back to you. I've just been deluged with captions. I've got a whole list of people who I haven't responded to who I mean to, but I'm just getting through captions on my own. Daniel, what is wrong with the Raphael? Place of origin? Uh, that and some very interesting <clears throat> take on maintenance requirements. This Russell, hey, wait, more. Or less, I hear more or less good things. They are very good for operating from the French perspective. From the British perspective, they are slightly more complicated. It's going to sound strange. It comes down to how do I put this? Sometimes I will tell you something is very good when it's operating from the British perspective. I, the tribal class is very good from the British perspective at the beginning of World War II. But it wouldn't be very good from the American perspective in the same time period. Because the Americans have to use the things differently. It's the same with the Raphael versus the F-35B and the Harrier. And the, F, uh, and, the, and the British. The Raphael is very good from the French perspective for what the French would expect for it to do. For the British, we would probably have ended up going with the F-18. Mainly because of the electronic warfare capacity of the E-18G. Sure, well, the uh, railgun is uh, for warning shots. I'm glad. But again, if you're firing a warning shot with a railgun, you're going to cause a huge splash. Hmm. Mitchell Oates, USS Ford, lame car joke, restricted to tropical waters because everyone knows a Ford runs like... That's cruel, but true. And, ooh, uh, apparently in 1848 UT time, minutes, uh, f uh, first manned water landings in 1976 will take place with the dragon la uh, uh, with the dragons crashing down. Um, right, Mitchell Oates. No, him. How would the Battle of the Atlantic Part Two change if both Scharnhorst and Eisenhower would have been sunk during Weirberg? Uh, ooh. Well, it would have probably started a bit later because if uh, Scharnhorst and Eisenhower had been sunk, because um, let's say Glorious had had aircraft airborne, had managed to get off a strike, and they got one of them got torpedoed, so they had to stay together to protect the other one getting back, and then they got caught by the heavy units of the Royal Net Home Fleet, which were out. Yes, we've still lost Norway. Probably. Possibly we're, mo we're motivated by victory over Scharnhorst and Eisenhower to really redouble our efforts in Norway, and that means we end up winning Norway. But let's say we lose Norway. You then have a scenario where you don't really have the surface radar threat as immediately. It doesn't start off there, and their first voyage doesn't take place. So you might well find that you have... Mm. It's going to be interesting, because it's kind of a case of, do the British continue to build battleships at the same pace they do, or do they slow down because they don't need them, and they concentrate on carriers, or are they concentrating on the smaller escorts even more? It's complicated, but it would still defend into mostly a submarine war, but it just wouldn't be that big surface raider threat wouldn't be there for a long time. And also, when the surface raider threat did come, without Sean Horson Eisenhower there, uh, well, they they can't generate as many ships, so they can't generate as theoretically as dangerous a task force. Say, Wilson, I've listened to people check claiming nuclear fusion power plants are only 10 years away for at least the last half century. Just that short a time? Um, you know, I, I think they've been talking nuclear, nuclear fusion. I've seen books, I think, talking about nuclear fusion in the written in the 1930s. Um, <sighs> Jeff Bieler, what a skill is totally commissioned. <laughs> oh, yeah. In theory, they were. In practice. Hmm. 
Richard Hughes, Horizon of BBC Science program talked about railguns in the 1980s. Yep, and by the time it makes the BBC Science, it's probably been around for about 20 years. Hi, Frederico Vega. Back in a second. Got some more books to go through. Please, Michael. Right on, right, let's see. Where was I? <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, Bishon, uh, Bishon um, there are also the nine attacker class escort carrier built on the Lenny Senior Shipyards 3RN. Returned to US and converted emergency ships after World War II. Yep, they were. Then if you are busy. I have only worried about you being so busy. Don't worry. I I get uh, I, it gets calmer. Calm Gasman. Dust Clark, good for the French. Yes, the World War One AH Tatra class worked fine, you know, the Adriatic. But it would have been cruel to put them in the North Sea. Yes, I know. The Adriatic, you talk, keep talking about it. Don't worry, I have plans. Bango. Have you heard about both forgotten weapons and the chieftain take on equipping the newly formed nation of Elbonia with 1945 equipment, but... Okay. Frederick Wecker, honestly, that question confuses the life of me. Um, because it says, have you heard about both Forgotten Weapons and the Chieftains take... Ah, I presume they're different. There are people. Take on equipping the newly formed nation of Albania. Ah, yes, there's a comma missing. Uh, I love this messenger system because it's 1945 equipment, but you are a traitor and select the worst equipment possible. What would your take on it be? Um, <laughs> someone's getting a lot of... <laughs> oh, someone's getting a turpit. Um, <laughs> ME262, is anyone? Uh, oh... Amazaski, is there a navalized version of the Tempest in plans, or RN will stick to the F-35? That'll depend on when the F-35 comes up to replacement. Um, Seth Thompson, Dr. Lark, seeing as we're entering Cold War 2.0, what lessons could be learned from the, uh, the naval camp mass games of the first one, with our slightly more aggressive adversaries this time around? You think the previous one wasn't aggressive? Uh, also, I find it funny that people always think that Cold War stopped. Um... Stephanie Wilson, I, I've only been paying attention to claims for about fifty years. Well, yeah, it's good of you to study that far back. Honestly, it is. Can't I, 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 I can't imagine any other reason. Um, Doug Clark, seeing as we're entering a cold, cold war two point the trouble is, I don't think we ever left the Cold War. I think the real lesson is that you have to give back as good as you get. You have to judge it, and you have to trust the commanders on the spot, but they have to give back as good as they get, otherwise they're going to get pushed, and that's going to be a problem. For Calvin Asman, Fusion 40 years ago, I saw scientific predictions for Fusion for 2020. Uh, now, CERN now says 50 years from now. Hmm, nice. It's kind of getting closer.
Frederico, uh, Frederico Vago, think Ita Italian size Navy in World War II, Elbonians mud export turks booming. I know the Dilbert uh, nation of Elbonia. And, um... Mm. There is some equipment around there, but really, by the end of... If I really want to be cruel, I would lumber them mostly with quite a lot of the German equipment. So, um... I'd like a King Tiger. <laughs> yeah, it'll break down every few miles, so you'll never be able to use it properly. I like what... There's, it's one of those interesting things, because the Germans produce some very good tanks. The Panzer IV, Panzer III are excellent tanks, and they're upgraded as time goes on. Panzer V, mm, Panther, yeah, I'll take it. But once you're getting onto the Tigers and the King Tigers, you're sort of going, okay, you're over-engineering this to the nth degree. I don't think Eskimo type valves on SSNs would necessarily be the answer. That would scare the life out of me, Daniel Freeman. Um, Jeff Bieler, what was the FAA pass in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan? When did it start? They needed swordfish crews for escort carriers as fast as possible, I think. Uh, pretty much the FAA are pretty much from the uh, part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan from the beginning. And certainly involved in it from uh, definitely from very early on. Sarah Thompson, um, rea fusion reaction is supposed to be online by mid 2050s, and in application for ships in 2070. Also, the main drawback with quantum computing is the heat generated, not just the power. Well, you could always stick it underneath the hull. Nicholas Wu, hi, hello. Hmm. Nicholas Hu, what do you think of the new Harry the Wolf class? I think they're fairly good for what they're prepared to pay for them. I'd have paid slightly more and got something slightly better armed. Basically the same hull, but probably with a... Mm, a bit more firepower included for dealing with the Russians. Must be a slightly tougher hull as well. Just to, in case the ice is thicker than... I, I want to go in places where the ice is slightly thicker than the currently planned. Jack Hunter, evening just clock. How different could the war in Mediterranean have been if the Italians knew they sunk, put out of action, both Agemus, Valiant and Atreus, Queen Elizabeth? You would expect them to have been far more aggressive. And expect them to have pushed far harder. It was one of the greatest tricks gone to mankind. They didn't realise that. This runs from, what's your take on Tyrannus? Uh, my take is that currently it's a lot of very interesting options being considered. When I actually see something that looks like it could be almost concrete coming out, then I'll start talking probably about it. Uh, DF, we hear a lot about Arsenal ships, but can that concept be transferred to large bombers using mass anti-ship missiles in Cornish's strike to overwhelm any anti-missile system? Uh, it could in theory, but it's going to be pretty expensive. The whole thing is the ship can require a very small crew and can sit there for when you need it. Um, if you're trying to load up aircraft, you're going to have to load up a lot of aircraft, launch them from a lot of air bases, uh, to get a similar level strike. It's going to be very, very, it, it's going to be far more complicated, let's say. Night in Home Production. HS Birmingham has a noticeably different bow to that of the rest of the town class cruisers, including uh, Edinburgh subclass. Do you know the reason for it? Odd question, but don't, uh, don't ask why not. Right. The reason was they were trying out a new bow. They had the idea that this bow would be a bit more efficient. And so the Royal Navy basically goes, yeah, give it a go. You're building enough of them, you can afford to do it. That's one of the advantages when you're building enough ships. It's like the Daring class in 1949. Four are built AC powered and four are built DC powered. Four have one type of boiler, four have a different type of boiler. And actually, it's two AC get two of the boiler, uh, two two of one type of boiler, and the other two AC get the other uh, two of the other type of boiler. So you actually end up with four classes 
There's four subclasses of two ships, effectively. And you get to test out the system. Does AC work best with that boiler or DC work best with this boiler? Which is the best combination? And then that's what drives your development for going forward. So you have the military purpose of the ships, but you also have the, the, science, uh, the technological learning. And that's what Birmingham is. Birmingham is a testing out of the hull because you can do only so much in tanks and simulations. Eventually, you have to build it and test it out. And they liked it. Himmlinger, considering the steady homogenization of the current USM CAW standardization around the F-18 -E CEFGs, well, F and G's most likely, has the capacity increased or the saving mainly monetary due to fuel wing? Um, pretty much it's been mainly monetary. Capacity was theoretically supposed to increase because you had more of one type of aircraft, but you know. Michaud's main concern holding back railguns, the power supply. Yep, this is why I'm predicting the first ship to deploy will probably be nuclear powered. Hmm. Vision, Dragon is re-entering the atmosphere. Cool. Robert Raceback. So Discord is throwing around ideas for arming and unmanned armed surface ships. The old school rail missile launchers also early Tico instead of VLS. Hmm. And early ticket on to the VOS. Mm, tempting. It would potentially allow you to keep it lower profile, but I don't know. Hmm. Strub, Doctor, do you think nations will consider a cyber attack on ships as an act of war? Probably. A ship is a, a warship is a sovereign territory. Interesting thing is, how are you going to do the cyber attack? Because theoretically, if the ship is hardened properly against nuclear and all these things, it should have enough protections to stop itself being it being hooked in, unless you can manage to find some way to bridge between systems. Danny Freeman, recently read a rationale for using C-Scepter sound tubes rather than Mark 41 VLS. That made sense, but don't see a rationale for going back to rail launchers. I would actually myself expect to see more Sea Scepter than, you know, rail launchers. But, you know, it's always fun to think about the idea. Because sometimes you can learn a lot by testing an idea out. Himmlinger. It's a um, mother beautiful tank. It's a piece of junk. The fuel system leaks all over the place. It's a piece of junk. Always with the negative waves, Moriarty. <laughs> it's the King Tiger. Um, so, 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 am I wrong to think that anything under a 75mm for a main gun is just a little small? The 88 was an amazing platform. Why didn't anyone keep it? Uh, because quickly the 105 came along. And the one of I was better. Danny Freeman. Um, the Islands had their own equivalents for an 88mm. In the British case, it was the 3.7 inch, which got turned into the 20, 32 pounder. But they actually jumped uh, 20 pounder, 80 something, to 105. Yep. I love it when I catch up and I find that the, uh, there is an answer written in there, which is about the same one as I just said. So that's always good because I get validation instantly. Uh, right. I'm glad to hear Bob and Doug are home and that Dragon is floating. That's good. Carl, uh, Carl Hartman, Dr. Scott, don't forget to give Albonia a grass Zeppelin or two with similar air components. That would be quite fun. I wonder if you could get an ME 109 to launch from the grass Zeppelin. Or even better, a Spitfire to launch from it. They can have some sea fires and escort carriers. That's great fun. In narrow waters. So, Thompson, don't think, uh, thanks. I'm still wrapping my head around the conversations. Christian Sanzo, just think 75 is tiny for a warship main gun. That is why very few people had a 75, because that's basically a 3-inch. 
Like the three inches, technically 76. <laughs> 75 millimeters huge for coastal horses, I suppose. Although I think I've heard a few of them having four inch guns, so actually probably not. Right time reduction. Uh, follow on from the Birmingham question. You just mentioned AC and DC. Don't any of you uh, uh, <laughs> jump on that? It is fun, AC, DC. Um, we've, we've all heard my ringtone once a long time. Um, in Daring class, was DC on all the ships like the Audacious class, Victorious? DC was on the first four, then AC were on the next four. And they did two and two and two and two. With the, 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 It was a lot of fun. Basically, they had a lot of fun. Um, Daniel Freeman, it just ain't about girth calibre, it's also about velocity and how much you can fit in the shell. Yep. Second so, awesome. the real entry for cyber element is attacks is the human element. And that is something we do have to consider. There was a case where uh, one of the daring class destroyers was severely damaged by four sailors going absolutely nutty on it. Uh, one thing I will apologise for this evening. A, there are the Monday evenings live is going to be moved to Tuesday this week, mainly because I've been sorting out so much. A, the work on Tuesday night has been put off for two weeks, so that's fine. Um, it's going to be all doubled up on another Tuesday night, which is already scheduled as not being as being Monday night. And B, because of all the um, work done on the what are they called the captions. I haven't managed to record tomorrow's live video, uh, tomorrow's introduction video. So what I've decided is I'm going to move the live to Tuesday night, if that's free. And this is going to finish at 8.30, so I can get all the captions finished off, and then I can have a decent night tonight and record all the videos tomorrow, and then everything we find on Tuesday night for the normal uh, for the live. So that's why it's going to be put up. Basically, it's just been getting 160 captions done to the new standard in the time allowed. Trentalenko, the gun versus missile trade-off in warships is increasingly going sideways given the arrival of precision guidance in the form of screw and fuses. There's all sorts of different things which is helping the guns. And it's a cost-benefit analysis. Strub, Doctor, if cyber attacks are an act of war, why is an attack on a drone not an act of war? Because it's an aircraft. See, that's the thing. Ships are considered sovereign territory. Aircraft aren't technically, because when most of the treaties writing warships were covering warships and the international treaty codifying of ships at sea were done, it was very much on the sovereign territory thing. When you have the aircraft coming in, uh, it's sort of more iffy, because if an aircraft is sovereign territory, because it can fly wherever it like, it could technically fly over your territory and claim it's sovereign territory, so that can't happen. But a ship is floating in water. It can only ever come to your coast. So it can be sovereign territory because it goes into port. It's always technically on the water, so it's always technically sovereign. So that is the difference, that ships are a different thing diplomatically than aircraft. There are issues still around boarding aircraft, and there are all sorts of treaties and things, and that is simplifying in a long way. But basically, ships are more complicated. Come on, Cyber attack on warship um, through the from the data link, albeit a worm or Turing vices. Uh, you could theoretically try and do that, but that's if you can get into the data link. Jeff Peter, RCN frigates have fifty seven millimeter um, fifty have a fifty seven millimeter main gun. So are going to be the Type thirty ones. Again, I would like them to be double. But, you know, they're singles. They're, I would like them to be doubles. I was asking, did anything come out of this daring experiment with boilers and ACDC? Presumably that if the second batch was built, it would have been best configuration. Was the knowledge used in other ships to build after darings? Yes, it was. And hence the type of AC was chosen, and the boilers became the Genesis boilers for an old next generation of ships which were running off that system before gas power started being implemented in, in a big way. 
Um, this is French fault. The 17 pounder 76 millimeter and the German 7.5 were arguably better than the 88. Arguably, yes. Yeah, just Calvin Gasman, you're being cruel now. LB in C fire with DB605 engines, no less. That's just being evil. Trentanagan, if you can trade off GPS versus IR versus small radar in a screw fuse, you have as many PGMs as. Yep. Then here, we prefer 6 pounder to 50 millimeter. It sounds better. I agree, it does. Jeff Beeler, post war coastal forces had a short 4.5 inch. Yes, they did. Rapid Razorback. I know missiles are faster and more accurate, but if, is a World War II heavy cruiser actually more heavily armed and capable of more destructive than a modern ship of comparable si uh, placement, not factoring in nukes? Well, let's put it this way. If you were talking in a, within range of just gun, of gun range, and you had to pick between an Alaska class or a Zumwalt, I would say you wouldn't enjoy either. Um... If you were talking a county class versus a type 45, county class is probably more powerful in terms of if you're within gun range. Hmm. Rapid Razorback, where is the 10 inch gun? 3, 4.5, 5, 5, 6, 8, 12, 14, 15. That's because the 10 inch gun prior to um, emails didn't really offer that much of an advantage, enough advantage in terms of penetrating power of the 8 inch versus rate, uh, penetrating power versus the 12 inch and rate of fire versus the 8 inch. I the ten inch well, didn't really offer enough of an advantage. You could it was far easier to go the eight inch or to go the twelve inch. Ten inch wasn't enough of an advantage in that sort of period. There were ten inches prior to that, but the rail guns are looking at ten inches, as that works quite well with their system. And I'd have to say yes, the British are finally going for the five inch because we finally decided. Frankly, we haven't got enough escorts. We can develop them on our own. And if we're only going to have Type twenty sixes and Type forty fives. Which carrying them, uh, we are going to have a maximum currently a list of 14 ships with them. Um, myself, I'm hoping that we get that ninth type 26 and then we get 15. If we can then get nine type 31s uh, on top of that, or 12, or, um, 12 type 31s, then we'll actually be in a decent naval position, escort wise. DF, it's World War Two. What's the worst ship class you would want to be assigned to in any navy? Oh, probably, uh, probably the. Um, there's a few classes of submarines I wouldn't want to be assigned to. I think they're one which I'd really wouldn't want to be assigned to. In the Royal Navy, and I'm just going to check its name because there's a dispute over its name. Uh, is the Grampus class, um, Porpoise class. Um, uh, because the only one who survives on them is HMS Royal Qual. Um, HMS Seal, of course, sort of survives World War II, but she does end up serving the Kriegsmarine, so um, she doesn't really properly survive World War II. So I would go, yes, with the, the Grandpa's class of the British. Um, for the Americans, there are certain um, minesweepers which I would really want to have avoided being in. So the town class was the ACDC Waterborne 2 High Voltage Tour. Yeah. 
Jeremy, aren't aircraft decks also national territory? <sighs> it's an interesting debate internally whether they are, but it's an interesting debate. In terms of theoretically they are, but there is some justification for not if they're sitting on an airport in the middle of your territory, whereas a warship definitely is. Then sometimes depends on the rate of fire. If you aren't worried about getting through heavy armor, then weight of fire becomes more important than individual shells or something. Yeah. Then Freeman, I think 10 inch probably appeared in the pre dreadnought era, but by the time of dreadnought, they weren't in fashion. By the time of dreadnought, they didn't offer enough advantage with the modern technology at the time. That's basically it. 10 inch offers an advantage when 10 inch is the biggest gun available. When 10 inch isn't the biggest of a gun available, you've got 15, 16, 18 inch available. Okay, right then. So I now need to arm a cruiser. Okay. What's my rate of fire on my 8 inch? 10 inch is broadly the same as my 12 inch. Which means it's about half the rate of fire on my 8 inch. Okay. That's problematic. Seriously, someone's being some people are being really nasty to Albonia, but as much as I dislike the Didos, I'm not sure I would consider them the actually worst for light cruisers because they did do some fairly good jobs of light cruisers. So, um, <sighs> worst light cruiser in 1945, probably some of the Italian ones, which ended up getting sunk by the tribal class destroyers. They had some really, really terribly weak light cruisers. If you can get annihilated by a force of destroyers, doesn't matter whether those are tribals or not, then you probably shouldn't be calling yourself a light cruiser. Ben Gregan, how does the 57mm for the Type 31 compare in uh, RF and sustained ready ammo stores to be used to the usual death gun? It's going to require... Well, it can take a lot more ammunition, but it does use it up a lot faster. So, basically, it's going to be fun. Carmen, I take a company of Comets over Tiger or King Tiger any day. We all would. Mishnotes, some USN armoured cruisers for around 1900 have 10-inch guns. USN's attitude was, why, oh, why did Uncle Sam build these ships not... Yeah, I can understand that. Staff Thompson, I don't necessarily agree, but it's worth considering the capacities of shells when looking at, say, a 5-inch versus a 155mm. The 5-inch is better. Hmm. Strub, Doctor, do you think if drone ships are attacked, uh, do you think nations will take it more seriously, or is it a human consideration that matters? I think they will take it more seriously. I think they'll take it very seriously if you try to board their drone ships, because that will be something which would set a lot of precedent. And remember, there's a lot of technology on a drone ship. Shooting down an air drone, a drone in the air, means it's damaged. It's probably you're not going to. You possibly might not get much technology from it, and if necessary, it can be. If especially if it hits water, it's there's going to be very difficult to recover anything. Salt water will do all the damage. But if you're trying to board a drone ship, oh, that's going to cause instant reactions. Angus my brain merely went to a scale model inside of a track vehicle with a turreted gun. I think it's time for more caffeine. Mmm, fun times. Come on, Gunsman, read gun range. Uh, heavy cruiser versus modern 8,000 ton warship. Fire... The, the thing is, whilst I would normally agree with you, and that might be the case, the fact is most modern missile systems, especially if you're on most modern ships, they're, uh, I'm not sure how well their missiles will get through my, uh, the ship's armor. So if its weapons are still working, you run out, you fired your eight missiles. If they haven't sunk the ship by then, then it's going to keep on firing. 
But if uh, my thinking was if they're attacking a land target, then uh, equally attacking a land target, then I prefer to be in the eight inch cruiser. New IKB four four seven two. Has anyone ever tried to board an aircraft mid air? I think they've done some testing out with transferring people mid air from Hercules to Hercules, but yeah. Century nine forty five. Century was the best tank, probably. Kahama, do you think the British should replace its similar vessels, Gibraltar segment, with variant of our in our lifeboats? I certainly would be looking at them. Yeah. A twin modern 5-inch map would be quite interesting, Daniel Freeman. It really would be. Oh. Mm -hmm. Carver Gasman, 10-inch uh, uh, ROF versus 8-inch ROF. Which 10-inch is which 8-inch? That's the question. Danny Freeman, um, 155mm or 6-inch gun will need to be created for a nail setup. There was an attempt to put an AS-90 gun on our ships as people thought it was an easy fix. Didn't work out like it, though. It's all about speed to pen. Large, heavy shells just have more momentum. A 2-pounder AT gun can pen a Tiger's front at 200 meters, but due to mess those out quick. Yeah. Where would you send HMS Eskimo on a goodwill visit to the US? I read tribals were going to visit their tribes, but the war got in the way. Ashanti did it. War got, uh, war got in the way. Uh, she'd have gone to Canada. That's where they'd have sent it. Canada. Probably the High North. Uh, probably Halifax, actually, but maybe you've gone around to the High North a bit as well. Paul Gatron, why would it? What would it take for anti-aircraft guns, longer range, not CRS, to have a comeback on ships? It seems like it'd make a lot of sense against the threat of missile saturation, higher rate of fire. Um, I would argue forty millimeter, fifty-seven millimeters returns is basically this case. Once you started, got seventy-six millimeter, fifty-seven millimeter, forty millimeter coming along, that suggests that they're already starting to look at it. Trentalaco, UK 9.2 inch had the best penetrating shell for its size. Nathan Oaken, historical engineering our superior naval weapons, rated it. Rated it as the best. Mm, probably. Jerry, right, with Dido's, that's a beauty of Elbona, trying to get worst option, but at the same time, looking like it's quite good. ME262 is good example. It's not pr it's next generation proven yet, but its engines work only eight hours, and that's before we get into the other issues with the uh, ME two six two. The F Albania needs the needs the Japanese CL Kanaki maybe that has forty plus torpedoes and just li led them with the American Mark two torp uh, Mark fourteen torps that circle over. Yeah. Hmm. Rapid race back. I'm looking for a good starter book on the war in Mediterranean. Have you read The Struggle for the Middle Sea by Vincent O'Hara? I have it up, up on my um, bookshelf somewhere. Yes, I've read it. It's fairly good, but... Yeah, it's a good starting point. I'm trying to think, really. This is a fairly good one. Sailor's Odyssey by um, Viscount Cunningham. That's a fairly good starter for the Mediterranean War battle. It is. Let's see. Right then.
Mm-hmm. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Where are we got to? Ah, Jane with Dutch Clock. Drac pointed out the excessive weight pro excessive weight problem with the 10-inch naval gun the other day as well. Something like twice the weight per gun as the 8-inch, not worth the penalty. Yeah, pretty much that. It's a, it's always it's battleship weight of gun versus yeah. There's lots of issues with the 10-inch. Um Oh, lovely. Abazaski hasn't hasn't Albonia suffered enough Narvik class destroyers. Stafford Thompson, Dr. Clark. While I think about Dra Daniel Freeman's information, say Belfast and Dragon ran away to Fiji for some fun. What would their offspring be? Oh god help us all. Um Mm. Well, it could be uh, some very interesting uh, vessels with some very interesting gun firepower. It's better at least to have six inch guns. Uh, probably a nice double turret. Maybe two of those mounts. Um, lots of VLS. Maybe even some Mark 41s VLS would appear with Tomahawks or Mark 53 VLS with Mark Tomahawks in appear. Um, ooh, lots and lots of 40mm. As they're closing weapons, so probably about three double 40mm mounts would appear as well. Bringing the ship. And a double hangar for helicopters, definitely. That's if um, Belfast and Dragon ran away to Fiji for some fun. Ben Grogan, my reason for asking that is the limited danger zone with PGM shells would make the Type 31 a pretty good support ship for a small commando force. Um, probably. They're, they've got it for the 57mm, and I think they're probably going to get it for the 40mm. Golden Eagle, the Russians already have a twin 5-inch mount on the Kirov class. Yep, they do. Well, they're a good gun as well for the Russians. Trenton Mekin. US, US Air Force have had a helicopter air to air personal transfer capability. Don't know how that happened in, uh, to, po to it post what happened to it post Cold War. I think they're probably keeping it going, but you know. Calm guys with boarding drone ship. And getting into ships data length, President. What about a Kandar beast captured by Iran? Hmm. You see, the the thing is, yes, it, but that was a first generation drone and first generation tech. And also, there is the fact that with a ship with the space in it, especially if you're talking about something quite big. And I was, I think this is coming from quite a lot of talk we're having on the ba about the future of drone ships and these sort of things. And I said. My plan was something along the signs, uh, lines and size of an LCU, probably even bigger, possibly slightly bigger, using something like a landing platform dock as a drone mothership. And the thing is, with that sort of size vessel, you can put in a lot more security for your data and communication security and packages. Greg Sarsky, lots of small boats around Dragon now and, and recovery vessels of, of in about 15 minutes. That's good. Moon Cox, I started off my reading on Maddow's Naval with two Ocean Navy. Oh, cool. Carl Gassman, re v w n t heavy versus modern. Um, if missiles knock out, say, a Des Moines radar, but do not knock out main armament and citadel, you still have a burning deck and incoming halo launch tor uh, torps. You, yeah, you do, but um, if you're in gun range to begin with, this is the point. The whole point of it was you're starting off in gun range anyway. So yes, you have those things, but they're also within gun range. And if you're starting your in, in gun range, they can see you and you're going, fire. They're going to be launching shells at about the same time as you're launching your missiles. So your ship is going to be hit by several 8-inch shells at the same time as you're hitting them with missiles, and then it's which going to survive longest. Now, 
They might have a burning deck, they might have damage done by the missiles, but the modern ship getting hit by a load of 8-inch armor piercing could be very interesting. The criteria was they had to be within range of each... They had to be within range of the shortest range ship. Ben Garing, with the return of 40 million attacks, do you believe that it is, is more missile defense or simply prioritizing small ship interception role for anti-piracy and drug interception? I think it's both. Those systems are very good for both of those missions. <laughs> Stafford Thompson, does a lot. Interesting book. The Odyssey I know is Homer's. Well, this is the Sailor's office, Odyssey. And there is also some around here. Happy Odyssey by Adrian Carton DeWitt. So basically, you have two classically educated Perth officers also both pick Odyssey for the title of their personal books. Juicy Shun, does the 10 inch versus 8 inch argument echo the Iron's real life change from 8 inch to 6 inch for their cruisers? To an extent, yes. Because once you realize that the 8 inches, uh, you can actually, if you, if you are using the treble 6 inch versus the double 8 inch, you can achieve a lot more or with the rest of that tonnage saved for the ship. And when you've got speed of fire up and all these things, basically Britain starts thinking, okay, what's going to suit our war? Are we, well, are we going to be using these 8 inch cruisers as small battleships or are we going to be using mass 6 inch cruisers? Well, we're building quite a large number of 6 inch cruisers. So, actually, we can get more pound for pound from our six inch cruisers, so we'll do that. <sighs> Mitch Lotes, give Albonia Kitami Kami with American Fart 14 torpedoes. Good lord, that's cruel. It's been a Mark 15 is the ship, surface ship base variant, isn't it? But actually, that was actually slightly better than the Mark 14. So I'd, I'd have the Mark 14. Then I, I think but my names know that the specialization of CO closed web systems over things like 40 mm gopers means a loss of capability while the tiny attack boats that will get close have to come back. Yeah. I think also, in the nicest way, the... Closing weapon systems work. It's kind of like pre World War II when everyone's talking about 20 millimeter cannons and the 40 millimeter pom pom, and by the end of the war, it's the 40 millimeter bofers, and everyone's developing three inch guns. Um, I have a feeling they're going to grow again. I wouldn't be surprised if you see a modification of the CI closing weapon system being attached to a 40 millimeter mount or a 40 millimeter being modded to being sort of a closing weapon system in terms of its closer to its role. I would love to see a Phalanx 40mm into service. I think that would be a really kind of interesting system. It would also chew everything up. Samuel, to think we nearly had 8-inch guns as the standard for USN destroyers in the late 70s. It would have been interesting. But as Mitchell Oates points out, 8-inch versus 6-inch, USN 8-inch supply shell, roughly 300 pounds, USN 6-inch shell, roughly 150 pounds. So yes, weight and RF is a consideration. Yep. So I would have said 6-inch would have probably been better than 5-inch for them. Rapid Razorback, why did the spear RN go with Spearfish instead of Mark 48? We developed it ourselves, and it blooming good, and it was a lot faster. It's still a lot faster. It's a very cool torpedo spearfish, as is tigerfish. Um. Millen Cox, today's anti ship and missiles are optimized for unarmored targets. Old armor is good stuff against them. Heat warheads are an option, but severely reduce the size of the explosive charge. Eh, yeah. 
Come on, What would initiate an 8-inch armor-piercing fuse on one ship? Nothing really, but my theory is that if they're going in and if you had them aimed at the hull, they'd come straight out the other side and create a lot of very big holes. Basically be a kinetic energy kill. So 8-inch armored shell would go all the whole way through the ship and come out the other side, so water would come in and go in the whole way in the ship. <laughs> That's the point. You might win the initial exchange. You might launch fire, but they will make so many holes in your ship, you will be leaking. And the trouble is, once you take off enough water one side, you'll have the holes which are slightly higher up the hull where they entered on the other side, letting in water as well. And then you have water coming in both sides and it'll just be a nightmare. Damage control <laughs> over. Maybe the armored sit uh, maybe the engine room would also have enough to actually set off the AP, fu a AP fuse. Um, Rapid Race, wait, is there any truth Carlton the Weird uh, was the inspiration of the Black Knight? Well, I frankly, if he wasn't, he should have been. Um, Ben Gergen, but I think there have been stories about a Black Knight going around British history for a long, long time. It's one of those mythical tales. Um, Ben Gergen, when you say both the 20 mm 30 minutes close to the most of the roof make them king in point defense, do you believe the targeting accuracy of the 40 millimeter has advanced enough to replace the RF? Need I'd say it's certainly reaching the point where it is getting there. I'd say it is. I actually it might even be there, but it's it is close. Rapid racer, why didn't the RN use Tigerfish on Belgrano in the Falklands? Because you're trying to sink a heavily armored ship. And they had some World War II torpedoes which would work. It seemed appropriate at the time. Danny Freeman, I think the Italians, and in fact, the whole reason the Royal Navy carried World War II torpedoes around that time was because of dealing with some of the bigger Russian ships. Danny Freeman, I think the Italians make a 40mm close-in weapon system, but they also claim you can use their 76mm as a close-in weapon system. Yes, they do, and they do. Now, 76mm has a shrapnel shell, which is absolutely... for a close-in weapon system. It basically fires a shroud of darts at you to go... Right, technically I have five more minutes before I have to go, because I have so many things I still need to do this evening. So I'll answer the rest of the questions, but I'm giving you a five-minute warning, theoretically. Right then. Um... Calm and for 40mm Gatling. There is a twin 40mm named Dardo and its successors. Uh, Dardo 40mm, as William Cox says, is uh, useful for other fire missions as well. Yes, but 40mm Gatling, just Imagine the experience of 40 millimeter gatling. And if I was being really cool, a cruel, imagine a double 40 millimeter gatling just spinning and firing at you. Yeah. That's the kind of thing which goes through my mind. Double 40 millimeter gatling mount. Basically, within a certain range, aircraft would cease to exist. Jermak, mm -hmm. um, naval application for the minimum CTA, um, uh, sub telescopic ammunition. Can, uh, yeah. uh, from Ajax AFV with programmable ammo would be look interesting. That is definitely an idea, but as long as you can make it work in saltwater environment, that's the trouble they're currently having with it. That's why the RN has gone with the bow for us rather than with the cased ammunition, because it don't work in salt water at the moment, which is why they're going with the bow for us. Um, DF, how did the Russian quad 57 gun perform in the Cold War? It looks very scary since the whole four guns to a mount thing. It was very scary and quite and quite effective. Um, for Russian systems, I, it could have been slightly bred with some British, uh, with some Western electronics in there. The Russian electronics are often the breakdown of their good systems. They have good ideas, but you know, mm. it's often why they go for heavier weapon systems to make up for electronics. Uh, Re, CIS goalkeeper used thirty millimeter from a uh, G eight Avenger, whilst Falcon uses twenty millimeter Vulcan. The size of a G eight rounds arguably have more punch than forty millimeter overfuls. Hmm. Arguably, that's arguable, Jay. Uh, oh my god, 40mm phalanx, you're a madman. That's like sending Ark Royal transatlantic via rocket. It will be so fun. Oh, 
Gershon, right. Um, Nick Wallace at uh, Women Cox. I was told by an XRN chap that goalkeeper made him nervous. With no other moving targets, it would track him walking down the deck of the illustrious. I think the other two are phalanx. Yes, it would. It was a fun system. But he probably possibly didn't realize that it had a manual system which would allow you to do that. So you could do that to your mates. Just go, I'm watching you. William Cox, what do you think of the Skirvel as a close-range last-ditch weapon? If you have it, you might as well use it. Jeff Beeler, what did FAA air groups look like in the in late 1940s? Was there a torpedo bomb or ASW plane? Uh, there was. There was something called the Barracuda, which was used for both. And it did quite well by that point, because by that point it was in a variation which would work. Seth Thompson, um, is there a rapid fast rate fire to also a loading system that can manage around the size of a six-inch? And not at the moment. You could try and develop one, but at the moment, no. 250 to 300 rounds per minute um, firing a six-inch um, shell would be very, very, in very, very intense for an autoloader. Let's put it this way. Thank you, everyone. Iron secondary guns use the same film of ammo as Gau 8, uh, but um, at a more sensible uh, rate of fire. I think it's based on a Bushmart auto cannon. Yeah, it's just true, Daniel. Samuel, uh, William Cox. Best way to get around armoring a warship would probably be something like a brooch warhead of the Storm Shadow. A heat warhead to punch a hole, then big warhead follows through. I would agree, but again, how many ships at sea have Storm Shadow? Mitch Lights, heard the story about Rodney's 16 shells against inch shells against Bismarck. They passed right through parts of the ships and out the other side without deafening. That's why you have the all or nothing armor system. <sighs> Take care, Night Heron Productions. Zav Thompson, thank you for another lively, engaging chat. It was a pleasure always. Hope you have a pleasant evening, Doctor. Best wishes to do your fluffy research assistant and whole family. Thank you, everyone. And remember, the video tomorrow night is actually going to be moved to Tuesday. I'm going to put it on the system and load it up so they will be registered on the system as being coming there. But, you know, I apologize for it, but it's literally it's dealing with the work I've had. Um, sure, Mac. Twin 40 millimeter the Gatling might be too much DACA. It would be an interesting scenario. <laughs> Calvin Gaspard, uh, double 40 millimeter Gatling against HTH TB-37 torpedo boat and two foot... Uh, again, on the Adriatic. Just had a hand, a hand operated once. I know, you do like the Adriatic. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, William. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg. Uh, mm. New IKB four four seven two. How does telescopic ammo work? Basically, it's all cased. It's a nice system though, but it, it is problematic uh, when it's all sort of done. It needs to, the salt water is the problem on the current cased ammunition. It's sensitive to it. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, Nick Waters. Until they get Gannett for ASW, which was ugly, it was beautiful. Yep. I agree. The Gannett was cool. And it did the airborne early warning as well. Take care, Jay. Take care, Jay Richardson. Uh, take care, Paul. Take care, Martin. Take care, Sean. Thank you, da Daniel. Um, I can have a nice evening. I enjoy getting my work done. And as I said, I've got 10 to do, so I'm going to get them done before I take the fluffy research assistant for his walk. Take care, Sadmiral, and take care, John Shea. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you to all the people who've liked and shared my videos. Thank you to everyone who's on the Discord, link down below. And thank you to everyone who just comes along and chats or just watches. It's always nice to see you. Thank you.